Well, hello and welcome to the fourth episode of the Rock 3 analysis series, where today we will be covering some of the transitionary material into the second theme, as well as discussing how to play some of the first theme, which we discussed in the previous video. So after covering all of that stuff about relationship of tonic to subdominant to dominant, uh, here's just a quick example of how that plays out in the actual playing. In general, there's this standard rule in all of classical music, which is that you want to place more on the tension and less on the resolution. In this case, the tension being the dominant leading to the tonic. So I have the tonic, a little more here on the dominant, and then resolve to tonic as a decrescendo. Another thing to keep in mind is uh, how to continue these half notes, uh, making sure that they can be held through the phrase. So tension, resolution, tension, resolution, and as part of this tension, even more. And this, I would really um, like to highlight this spot because as we're going to talk about in a second, this is B flat major, the key for the new theme. So this is our first big introduction. He writes ritardando and diminuendo. So really try to have a special tone here. More tension building. And we're back at uh, the statement of the theme in the orchestra. Completely different material in the piano. What I want to do with these 16th notes is to provide motion that complements what the orchestra is doing. I think it can get tempting here to just play really noty. as I've heard at some points. Um, however, I really would encourage people learning this to also play what's written in the accompaniment because it'll help for instance, a place like this you can complement that and then this is kind of a new phrase. So try to mimic that. A lot of people, including the Horowitz recording, like to make this area a little bit more articulate. And I think that makes sense, again, because of what's happening in an orchestra. You have this upward motion in the bass. Um, it's pianissimo. And then he starts to introduce pizzicato later on here. So the texture is lightening up, and uh, you don't want to sound overbearing as the soloist in this section especially considering that it's going to lead into this Pew Vivo with a renewed sense of energy. So to have that renewed sense of energy, you kind of need to taper off. Sometimes it helps to find melodies within the melodies. So, which fits. And here we arrive at the ending of the first theme, leading into this transition, and it has... something called a circle of fifths sequence. Now what is a circle of fifths sequence? 
That's a good question. First of all, we look at the circle of fifths here, which is arranged with all the notes of the chromatic scale. So in our scale, there are 12 notes from in the octave from C to C. However, it's not arranged chromatically. In other words, it's not arranged step by step like it is on the keyboard. In this case, it is arranged by fifth. So if you go up from C, up a fifth, you get G, up a fifth, D, A, E, B, F sharp slash G flat, D flat slash, slash C sharp, A flat, E flat, B flat, F, and finally C. Now the reason it's arranged this way instead of chromatically like it is on the keyboard is because of the way that key signatures go. We're introducing one sharp and one flat at a time. So the key of C has no sharps, no flats. G has one sharp, D has two sharps, A has three sharps, etc. Going around backwards, we're going down a fifth and we're progressing along the flats. So F has one flat, B flat has two, E flat has three, etc. On the inside of this circle, you will see the minor scales which correspond to the major. So the third concerto is in the key of D minor, which we call the relative minor of F major. They share the same exact key signature of one flat. Now the second theme is in the key of B flat. As we can see, it is a closely related key. It has one more flat than D minor, but we have to figure out a way to get from D minor to B flat major. Now beginning in measure 49, we have the start of this circle of fifths sequence. Classical music is full of examples of this type of sequence. Uh, usually it is used when we want to transition to another key or go from some kind of episode back into the main theme. And Rachmaninoff does something interesting here. And we're going to track the bass to see what's happening. So C, F, B flat. So far we've gone along the circle of fifths. We would expect it to do this. To go to E flat. If we're going traditionally through. However, he goes three steps. And transitions across to E up to A, then to D. Again, we're tracking the bass here. So we have the left side, we have the right side, back to the left, and then our dominant leading back into our tonic. So in a way, one could argue that this particular circle of fifths chord progression is being used as some foreshadowing of what's to come. However, it comes back to the transition. It doesn't lead straight into theme two, as some pieces might. Now, when it comes to this uh, transition thing, there's honestly not that much interesting material, harmonically speaking. Uh, to show you what I mean, It's very static harmonically. Um, it's not really moving away from center. It's really sticking to D. And every time you think it's going to go somewhere, it usually comes back. We're in the subdominant. We're not far away. And we're back at D. We're at F which is not far away, that's the relative major. However, what is interesting about this transitionary material is that it's going from diatonic to chromatic. Uh, what diatonic means, you have the notes of the minor scale, sometimes it might be in the harmonic form, uh, or the melodic form. All of a sudden, uh, 
we're seeing a bunch of chromaticism. So we're seeing those half steps appear. That also leads to tension. It also leads to movement. So in these little micro cells, we're having lots of tension to resolution. And this is just all pure chromaticism. So in a way, this is all leading up to something. It's saying that this stasis of D minor is going to change, but we don't exactly know yet how that's going to happen. Again, it arrives at fairly light resolutions. Now here at measure 69, he writes allegro, so we're at a new tempo. Now here at measure 69, we arrive at a perfect textbook example of what is referred to in music theory sometimes as a dominant prolongation. So if you look at 69 through all the way up until measure 81, the bass really doesn't move away from A. And if it does, it's only to reinforce A. So we have... goes to F, but only again to reinforce A. Then in this uh, little mini cadenza that the piano has, the A is ringing out in the bass. It returns to the bass A at measure 81. And so we're left wondering if this is ever going to resolve because it's held for such a sustained and long period of time that something has to happen, something needs to change. Here we find something of this, what might be called the Arabic scale or the sometimes referred to as the double diminished scale. And I think one of the reasons that Rachmaninoff used it is because in music that uses this, it stays very glued to the center note, or uh, in this case, the A. Because the G sharp pulls to A, and the A flat sinks to A. So this helps to keep this dominant having its feeling of needing to go somewhere, but not really sure where it's going to go. Again, we have this B flat to A. Da -da -e -da -da -da. And finally, we arrive Lots of people, by the way, like to add in a low A, which I find really effective, especially on a concert grand. And then something strange. We expect to return to D, but we find ourselves in this weird F center. And this is our first clue that we are headed to the key of B flat major instead of the key of D minor. Why? Because F7 is the dominant to this new key center. Now this leads me to the next musical concept that one needs to know in order to understand what's happening in this music, and that is the secondary dominant 
or what is referred to in some countries as the double dominant. So when you're trying to transition from one key to the next, for instance, D minor to B flat major, you need to set up that new key. Usually the way that it's done is to place the dominant of the new key somewhere in a chord progression to get that need for resolution in your ear. In this case, the A leads up to B and the E flat, the seventh, leads down to the third of B flat. So here we are. And there's some chromaticism going on. But we're still technically at F because the bass hasn't changed. Now he does something interesting with this chord, B flat seven, which is the secondary dominant of E flat. So have we transitioned to E flat? No, not really. Because he uses this E flat as the four subdominant, dominant, tonic. And here we are at measure 93 at the beginning of theme two. I'll cover more on theme two in episode five. However, I just want to make a couple quick comments about it. Now I actually have a perfect personal example of why it's a good idea to analyze the music. When I played this piece in the past, I'm a little embarrassed to admit that I did not recognize this section as the start of theme two, this uh, staccato part. Reason being that I had associated the lyrical melody in the piano so much with the second theme that in my mind that was the start. However, structurally, when we look at this chart, we realize, no, actually, this is the start. It's, and it's interesting because from a perspective of the listener, it sounds so different. Uh, this is really light. And this is so tender and loving, but it's really the same melody. So now when I play this in the future, I'm definitely going to have a different realization in my mind on how that theme transforms into the lyrical theme. Now besides the circle of fifths, the relationship of D minor to B flat major can also be thought of as the relationship of a third. So D to B flat. In the Romantic era, it was common to do this. People like Schubert loved transitioning in themes from uh, up, either a third up or a third down. And this relationship of thirds from D to B flat can even be seen in places like this transition where up a third this is up a third and C is finally up third so we have moved from D minor to F major to A minor to C major notice also the transition minor major minor major then we have a B flat, which is the Neapolitan or the flat two of this dominant. Anyways, I hope that is helpful information. It helps you to play this piece and understand this piece. Don't forget, if you want some free piano advice, I'm still giving these online lessons. You can check out the recent lesson I gave on the Bach Busoni Chacon. Just send me an email if you have any other questions or if you want any other lessons. But in the meantime, stay tuned and I will see you on the next video.